Good. So we're very excited. We are here at the Armory and very excited, both Tom and I, <laughs> to do this interview with both of you uh, in preparation of the Gesamtkunstwerk, which is going to happen here uh, in a few weeks. The idea is to talk about the genesis of the installation um, and many, many other things. I thought we could maybe, as Bazian Ara always said, we should begin with the beginning. Um, and it's around 2007, 2008 that you started to work about uh, white snow. It then materialized for the first time in an exhibition uh, called White Snow, which really marks your first engagement with the Snow White theme. And I was wondering if you can both maybe tell us uh, how the Snow White story entered the work and how it all started. Let's see, what was we do? We, were, we did the Pirates, <clears throat> and then we did, um, we did Piccadilly, then the Pirates. And after the Pirates, uh, I think probably I was, I was looking for something, or maybe it had come up a little bit before. I'm well, not we sure. talked about it because I was discussing theme park rides. Because when we did the Pirates, like I went to Disneyland a ton of times and would just ride the Pirates of the Caribbean ride over and over again. And then we started discussing, like, we've always kind of been into these theme park ride things and, and how that kind of goes. And then as I was going to ride on the Pirates of the Caribbean, the Snow White, White ride is pretty close. And it would be like, oh, this, this line is so long, I'm going to go on this ride and see what happens. And then so I'd go on these rides, and then we'd talk about, like, how almost archaic those rides were compared to, like, other rides that are at theme parks now, but how gigantically popular they were. Mm. Then we discussed Snow White very briefly then. So I think that was maybe the yeah. initial talk of it, but it wasn't even as a theme. It was just as a play on this idea of a ride more than like really what, where we are now with White Snow. I mean, White Snow now developed into something totally different. Uh, but I think there was this thing where I was at that time after the Pirates and after Disney and, and Disneyland and stuff. I, I kind of remember at one point, like, almost like, like, why hadn't I thought of it before? Or why hadn't it even come up before? Right. Like Snow White, like, uh, you know, Heidi had come up and I'd considered remaking Heidi and we talked about, we were actually went so far as to try and locate a, a place, a uh, an old hut in the Alps. Like when I <clears throat> originally, when I did Heidi with Mike, the original thing was it, it actually happened two or three years before I even met Mike. I tried to do Heidi in the French Alps, and I wanted it to really be in the Alps. And then Mike and I had talked about doing pieces together. And then when the, this Viennese show came up, we just both I, I'd already told the dealer that I wanted to make the story of Heidi. And then Mike said, why don't we do it together? But Mike was really interested in Adolf Luz. So it was really the coming together of Adolf Luz and Heidi, the piece. And the building was that way. But it was this thing of doing it actually in the Alps. And then later we tried to do it in the Alps. So I'd been thinking about like themes like Heidi and wanting to redo Heidi again. And we kept talking about it and we kept, you know, we looked in the Alps to buy a place. And then somehow it was also like, whoa, Snow White. Like how come it didn't happen? And uh, because everything was sort of there what I was kind of, in the same way that Heidi had things I was interested in, Snow White had it. And uh, then it, at that point... That was closer to home in a way, like not even physically closer to home. I mean, it was closer to home to us than this place that where you live in L.A., where this is, I mean, Disneyland's a deal there. So it was also like the relationship to Heidi was very close, but then it was also like the direct relationship to us being in L.A. in this crazy theme world. Um, and Snow White being connected to Disneyland, where Heidi not as much. Yeah. And we looked again this morning at uh, lots of your catalogs and books, and in the earlier catalogs of books, it doesn't really show up in drawing Snow White. So it really started, as you said, around 2007, 2008. Do you remember? And it, it happens like, like a little sudden. Like, yeah. I think it had been building, and they'd come up in conversations, yeah. but it was just like all of a sudden, bam, it's Snow very White. Immediate. Do that you show remember the first, the the first drawing it popped up? Was it in a drawing? Or well? I, there, were, there were a number of smaller drawings that happened to Snow White, and then... And small sculptures kind of started to happen? Yeah, very and, the, and then the big drawings happened. Yeah. And the big drawings, uh, you know, then, the, in a way, 
a development of, of an idea of what Snow White could be, not a, in the sense of, you know, like using uh, a number of the images used uh, motifs of Disneyland, but it was really about adapt or Walt Disney Snow White. But it was a, there was this whole thing of finding, uh, or other things started happening, like movie stars began to appear to be Snow White. You know, uh, women in magazines would all of a sudden be Snow White, and the thing starts becoming. Like, like almost using the base or the core of the Disney Snow White and then just using that as a structure to identify, like the viewer identifies to that. But then it just unravels into another state of like women as Snow White, uh, the culture and the conditioning of how, what Snow White is or, like it starts, you know, the core is there and then it just starts unraveling and, and a lot of unraveling and uh, investigations happened in those big drawings. Whether they directly translate to what we did in the video, yes, no. In some ways the drawings are somewhat separate. I think that separate. was a motivated part yeah. to it, but a translation I think that in a lot of ways is they're sort of unrelated. Yeah, it could happen though, you know, like, I think the whole thing of going back and filming again, you kind of think we go back and film again, maybe Snow White, you know, we ask Cindy Crawford. Yeah. Like, you know, like it's like it doesn't, it's like it, it could unravel another way, you know, and, uh, or it can expand another way that we haven't seen yet. But it did, there was a kind of the drawings and then somewhat a disconnect with the video and the performance. And that was true, I think, of the dwarves too, the sculptures. Mm -hmm. The dwarves the, and the, the forests? Well, the, no, the dwarves, the sculptures, like the rubber sculptures, the bronze sculptures, was very much about the thing of the physicality of making the sculptures and the, the technique of fuck up or abstraction is fucked up and this thing of abstracting the figure and performing on them. And then when we made sisters, like another, but they're very much in, you know, at one point I even tried to take the sculptures, the bronze or the silicone, and I tried to make a similar nose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we made all these noses for the dwarves to wear. Great big phallics, limp phallics, big Everything bulbs. from a tiny ball to a huge thing. And we, in the end, it, it was, we threw all that out. So the translation from these sculptures, the bronzes or the silicones, in a way, other than the big floppy hat, and the big floppy hat had happened in the drawings. And, very early. Yeah, but yeah, very early. But the, and the floppy noses, or the big phallic noses, never made it into the, uh, to the film. In one way, you could say only the, only the floppy hat translated from the sculpture to the character in the film. Yeah. And in some ways you could say it, a lot of the drawings in that didn't, I think there's an element of sexuality in this whole thing of the, of, uh, in the drawings, the thing of the, the person of desire or how it's seen in culture. And I think you could say, yes, that translated from the drawings into, into, the into the piece. Yeah. But we then reinvented what that meant. Yeah, you know? and pushed it to another place. And it could, and then you end up in a kind of situation where the drawing is one thing, the sculpture is one thing, you approach them one way, they find themselves because of the materiality of what they are, and then you go to a performance and you're in a whole other ball game. And sometimes those elements of the drawing or the sculpture don't translate into the film and the video. So there's a somewhat a disconnect. There's, there's the, but at the same but time. But it's very mild. I mean, you know, we were like, you know, all white snow for the last few years. It's been where we've been at. So in every relationship from the drawing all the way down through the videos, there is a disconnect, but I mean, 
It is still, connect. It's still the same, you know, like it, it's still and a function. Yeah, and I think that like you can read what happens, that you can read what happens in the video and you can see it in the drawings, it's there. Yeah. But there's the, you know, I, a lot of things happened on the way to the, on the way to the video. <laughs> when was the moment of saying, I, I want to use my childhood home? Well, the, the, the evolution, late, yeah, late. The Very evolution, late. The, the evolution of the piece that way was that one of the other issues besides the forest, and we finally pull the trigger and start building the forest. The other issue is what would the dwarf house look like? And for a long time, we made I made a lot, a lot of drawings of uh, and models. And we and have models. several models of a traditional. It's the Disney house. Disney house. Yeah, I mean, and we giant made ones. And big ones, and I f we figured out every board. Yeah. We figured out. We went through the we animation. We constructed the movie to figure out how the architecture of the house works because it doesn't work. You know, there there is no. It doesn't work. That the way the house is and the way the inside of the house functions in the cartoon, they, it, it's impossible. You, it doesn't work. There's the upstairs, the steps. Like we broke the entire house down and built this house exactly like it was in the cartoon. And then we're like, this is impossible. You can't, the staircase so doesn't get upstairs. So then we had to shift everything. No, so yeah, so then but it was, that's almost macabre too, yeah. you know? Sure. <laughs> it, it, it makes does. sense, which is the great part, is that it really fit it really in worked. our idea of it. And we, we liked it. We, we wanted to push that house and how to figure this out and abstract the house and make the ceiling weird. And then the, there was this thing of like, you know, building the house, we go through the whole process, Disney house. But one thing that was always central to the Disney, or to the house, to this, uh, to the house, the dwarf house, was that in my mind, I had this whole thing about an underground basement area that would be like three floors, or three or four layers going down, and the staircases would go down, and the crazy thing is, is the staircase went down and then would turn to the left, and then another staircase come around, flip around, turn to the left, and there were these rooms, and the rooms were divided into what was called a rumpus room, a bedroom room, and a torture room. And they all were underneath the dwarf house. And then at one point I realized, wow, the way the staircases and the rooms are structured, it's the house I grew up in. My house, you went down the stairs, turned to the left, and that was my bedroom. I think and before the, that, though, was you develop, you started to develop a a connection between your mom and Snow White. Yeah. Which, which I think started this relationship between his childhood and the Snow White image, you know, because Grandma did look like Snow White. I mean, she had they, very pale skin and black hair. And she would always wear super red lipstick. Yeah. So there was this thing, it was like, at one point he's like, wow, Snow White really looks like my mom. So then it kind of started turning. And then I think at a moment he realized like, oh, the staircases, really like my house. It's my house. And I this bedroom and this rumpus room are really like my house. And you had the, the memories of the house, and I remember when we well, visited you, uh, it, it had a lot to do with memories, but did you go back to the actual Well, house? what happened though, before we go that far, is, is that we, at one point I realized the basement is my, I'm building my house, where I grew, I slept in the basement. So then it was like, oh, whoa. Then I realized this crazy thing about the dwarf house, it's a T-shaped house. It's like this, big room, room off of here, you enter here in the corner, T-shape. At one point I thought, oh, I'll, f I'll, I'll leave the dwarf house the same, but I'll flip it and it'll go the other way, which is the way that my house grows, this way, like this, I'll go that way. And then it'll be the dwarf house, but it'll be in the configuration of my house with a basement that is my basement that I grew up in. But the series of rooms would reflect the rooms, one being the rumpus room, one being my bedroom, one being the workshop, which is, would be the torture room. These rooms would reflect that, and the house, the dwarf house would be the same except for a T-shape. And then, and then at some that, point- That was an easy connection after that. Yeah, then it was just then like- Then it was like, why am, I go to the why studio not, one day, and there's like a maquette of his house as a kid in the place where the Disney house was, and he goes, what do you think of that? <laughs> and it was kind of like, that connection was really just like overnight. After all these other processes where there was these big decisions, this one really kind of came quick once, once you got to that level, and then it was just like, well, what We're if we there. just put this here? And then you, and you had, of course... Then it was a super difficult 
um, decision also because it took it so close to him. Yeah. You know, like it really became very. You personal. realize right away. Oh wow, you're going to unravel something here. Yeah. You're heading down and a path. And can you deal with that? Why? You know, what does Why it, though? Well, that's a question. It's, it's like a lot of things like that. You have a fear and then it doesn't. You know, am I unraveling something? You know, memory, subconscious, whatever. I'm, am I? And the answer is, well, yes and no. The answer is, yeah, I am unraveling things. As it brought up really, as it brought up painful memories, some of which I thought would be really. My both my parents died in the bathroom on the same day. In the four same years day, apart. four years apart in the same place in front of the toilet. Well, that bathroom is there. So you go in that bathroom. That's where and it they looks died. identical. It's identical. So yes, you would think, whoa, I can't go in the bathroom, right? Or like, whoa, I can't make, I can't make a piece that, that, you know, is really fucked up in that bathroom. That's sacred ground. I can't do that, right? Well, the reality was It no, didn't even matter. Didn't matter. Like there are other things happened that did matter, like other associations that were troubling. So you go, you know, like am I unraveling? But there is a fear factor where you go, are you going to unravel something here? Because what you're doing, in a sense, is it's not just that you're making the house. You're actually, you're actually creating a theater in the house, and the theater you're creating in the house is, in, in a way, a subconscious theater. Like right. you're, so what the fuck's going to come out, you know? Then you put on top of that the individuals that you're going to work with, you know? And where are uh, they going to go? A, a woman who looks portraying Snow White, my Snow White looks, looks like, like my, my mother. mother. Snow White looks like my wife, like Snow White looks... So what, uh, what are you going to do there? All of a sudden you're acting out and you know that the, the pathway is going to go a certain direction and you could say, I'm going to back out of here, this is too fucking weird. On the other hand, you keep going because that weirdness is going to maybe... Really, something's going to fucking happen here and you're going to make it something that counts. Like, uh, you're going to make something that says something, that does something. It's very personal to you. Yeah, so there was this element of all of a sudden, I wasn't just talking about the social and the cultural, I was talking about the personal, you know, and the theater of the personal, and my mother's in the house, right? And then the crazy one happened, I think it was even Amy that said it, well, what about Walt Disney? And the crazy thing is, David and I just made this piece, this thing with Franco, with where we did the rebel thing, and I, I ended up being Nick Ray, and there was a Natalie Wood, and I'm this kind of crazy, you know, I become like this director. Slightly deranged, deranged, crazy director that is surrounded by these youthful kids of actors and the manipulation of that. Yeah. And all of a sudden you go, Nick Ray, Natalie Wood, and then all of a sudden it's bam. I go, White holy Snow, shit. Walt Disney. White Snow, Snow White, Walt Disney. And then it's, then it's like Walt Disney, same period as my father, combs his hair the same way, stands in front of the mirror, you know, like Walt Disney. So you end up with these associations which only layer the thing. And then, of course, I'm, it's not Walt Disney. In the end, yeah, it's Walt Disney to some in one way, just as it's not Snow White. It's actually... Like, are we making Snow White? Well, it's sort of the loosely based on the narrative of Snow White, Disney Snow White, or the Grimm's Tale Snow White. Pretty loosely, loosely, loosely based. And it's the same way. It's not Walt Disney. It is, but it's not. Actually, it's kind of like my father, but it's not my father. Yeah. It's actually some iconic image of a 50-year-old man, you know? And probably it's in a 50-year-old suburban house. And it's, you know, like, it, and that's the theater. The theater is, is this 50-year-old man, me, as Walt Disney, or Hugh Hefner, or Adolf Hitler, or Paul McCarthy, and White Snow, daughter, wife, my mother. They become multiple characters. And in, in a sense, the narrative in the theater is a narrative in theater that crosses over all the fucking time. Like, yeah. one minute I'm 10-year-old Paul McCarthy and White Snow is my mother. And the next minute it's, uh, it's a love affair from Corel or something, you know, and it's uh, like it's shifting, you know. And, uh, and Walt sort of happened, like it was obvious when it came up that Walt 
And then it was all sudden, like, oh, I know who I am. It was I a am. pretty quick switch there, too. Yeah, um, I know who I, I am in this. One of the things that we were struggling with then is, is that when we did decide to do the Armory show, is that it, it was at that point, okay, you have this much time, and you're this far, and you've got to get this far. So the decisions then needed to happen quick. And how, you know, originally I think that Paul was going to be in the movie less. I mean, yeah. it, it was going to be more like we were going to hire just actors and we were going to shoot this in a much more, I don't know, quote unquote traditional manner of how we dealt with actors and making this movie. Um, and I think it was because it maybe you didn't know where your place was then. Yeah. Of how how to be I really Walt would. Paul. There was no there was none of that. Well, there was this idea. Of, I mean, I think you talked maybe in December. You had a structure to the, how this was going to play out. You know, it starts here and it goes through this goes yeah, through different phases. There was, a, phase, a, goes there was a script of some. And, yeah. But you, I, something that struck me all, all the time. He said, and then it'll get crazy. And you kind of did, did, yeah, but you didn't tell. I mean, what you there was a level of improvisation that became in a sense, much more extreme, probably, in different, different ways, psychological ways and physical ways and uh, um, duration, you know, um, than I think probably you expected at the beginning. And th this was still a performance, you know, that we were trying yeah. things out. Yeah, I mean, I think that we, you know... I think we always know it's going to get crazy. Yeah, but I think that in this case, you know, like, I... I... Once I realized and once the suggestion had happened and that I would be some type of character that had some relationship to Walt Disney or Walt Paul, it, for me, it cleared up a whole... Once the house it happened... It really focused yeah, what we were going to do at that yeah, point. Once the forest happened, happened, once the house happened, once I was Walt Paul, bam, then we, we were on... Kind of well on our way. And because I think the dwarves, in a certain way, are, it, as I think they, to some degree, represent male, or some sort of boy male, mm -hmm. all of them. Collegiate. And like, there's like yeah, one sort of. thing, at one point I think they're, they're like one thing, and... We actually did, changed their reference from dwarves to dudes at one point. And because men. It, and yeah, because it was more about like, Men, men, and not Where, dwarves. Like do the, the men to have a their, do the men have their hats. Sense. Are the men on? Are the men on yeah. set yet? <laughs> you know, or the boys? Are the yeah. boys on set yet? Where are the men? Yeah. You know, as opposed to where are the dwarves? You know, like the dwarves where, thing didn't make sense to us at that point anymore. It wasn't about that. And we had dwar We had men who were six foot five or six, seven. seven. We had six, guys from six seven to four two or something. You know, from. A hundred pounds to five hundred and something. <laughs> <laughs> Sleepy's giant. So it, you know, uh, what else? I mean, they did. They did <laughs> take on the, the names. You know, that was about the closest relationship to it. Yeah. I think at the certain moment you mentioned Grimm. And what? I think Grimm. You mentioned the Grimm brothers, no? Yeah. Rudolf Grimm, the Grimm brothers. And I think yeah. what is interesting is that obviously um, there is something much darker in the Grimm brothers than uh, in Disney. And I just think it would be kind of interesting to hear a little bit to which extent the Grimm Brothers are a source. Is there a return to the source? Or? Not, Not really. really. The Grimm Brothers, I mean, what happened when we were doing it is once we start to just go after it, it becomes just this crazy kind of research of anything snow white, white snow, anything that way. We just kind of try to envelop ourselves into it and figure it out. And the Grimm thing, was just kind of, I mean, it was very short-lived for us. We just talked about, I think the only thing. You brought up things. Th there was the only thing that, the, for me, the, the, in the Grimm story, there's no names for the dwarfs or men or dudes. There's, there's just one through seven. Um, Snow White is actually not 15. She's only seven, which to me really? changed the whole wow. deal. You know, like it, it took it from like these dudes into this thing. Yeah, it, she's talked about as like a child, you know, and when she dies, she doesn't really die, you know, and then, but this, this prince is a much older man and she's much younger, but then there's this love affair and this attraction and this like obsession with this object as a woman and how, you know, the, even this youngest woman still affects this group of men. And I think that's kind of the only thing for me that even played with it. It was that you had these men 
and this young child woman? I, I think that, you know, when, I, I, I can't remember exactly, at one point I started writing, I actually wrote a script, I think on a weekend, and uh, pretty much wrote the whole thing. Like, and, um, and then I think I showed it to you, mm -hmm. and then, and then I. And then it really broke down. Yeah, the then I started really making drawings, down, so. and the drawings went on for a long, long time. And then it got organized again, and then we had people organizing it, and then I tried to organize it again, and then the, it. So it what was kind of crazy. The continued constantly. Yeah, in the end, I think I made three books that are about this thick, big books, and they have a bunch of drawings of me doing things, dwarves doing things, white snow doing things, writing all over them and it occupied a kind of script. And at one point I had someone go through, and uh, it was actually Elise went through, and I just said, type everything, type everything you can read. Just type it. And kind of like forming a script, like every word that I said. And then it kind of took that and then I started working on that, and then took it again. So it was this evolution of the script. And in the end, what was so crazy to me it was it was like 40 pages. It was like two years of, of like working on this thing. And in the end, the script's like 40 pages. It maybe was like, less. Maybe less. It was like <laughs> hardly anything, right? And then, but a lot of drawings. But I think in all that, you know, like one thing that came up was is that this this woman and we we kind of we didn't care too much about the queen never was too critical we didn't no. care much about the witch we didn't care much about the castle we didn't care much about the prince essentially what happened is snow white white snow and that was a whole thing too of shifting her name you know like shifting her name to white snow or ws was like which happened really in mammoth yeah when we went to do that shoot up there. Is that when it happened? That's when it really, I mean, it was the White Snow Mammoth tapes. Yeah. That's what we came from there, and that's where the, the, the real title happened. Like, it officially wasn't just like switching it or figuring out, it was just at this point, you know, now it's White Snow. And then it, it was like, we went through this whole thing of looking at dresses. I, that went on for, I spent- we Tons spent, of dresses. Tons of dresses. And we were heading down the route of the Disney dress. And then it was all of a sudden, whoa. Then it became about primary. And then, yeah, all of a sudden you realize the Disney dress is red, yellow, blue. And that's the primary. And then I'd written in there, I'd written in the script that at one point, during a, during a kind of hallucinatory drunken, f drunken binge, there are three Snow Whites in the room. And then at one point it was like, well, obvious, red, yellow, blue and the primaries, and they were referred to as the primaries. And I started talking about them as the primaries. Yeah, when the three were to get, when we'd, do shoot, when we'd shoot with three of them, it would be the primaries. It wasn't, there was no even connection to the white snow. They were just primaries. Which is interesting for us too in the same filming thing because then it becomes like the three main people. You know, like a primary color is the same as a primary actress. Yeah, and that, you know, they, I think that that then broke it away from, it was breaking, we were breaking away from the Disney thing, and we were breaking, by going white snow, she isn't Snow White. She's a version of Snow White. She's a reference to Snow There's White. It's a play on it. It's a play. She, Snow White, white snow exists because Snow White is in the past. I actually wrote that. Uh, where is it? Um, white snow is an alternative to Snow White. White snow references Snow White simply because she, Snow White, came first. White Snow is a caricature and a parody of Snow White while not being Snow White. You, like the you know, fact that she's a parody and a caricature of Snow White, and at the same time she is not exactly. Snow White. But you and said at the beginning, you said, you know, I look at, I saw, thought of Snow White, you know, you were going to, the, to Disneyland and talking about Snow White, I think about Snow White, and you know it's all there. You know, like, I think a lot of people will read this, when they see this piece, They'll read it as a kind of uh, like unrepressed version of all the latent uh, elements of the Disney Snow White. Uh, I and think it's a latent. I mean, maybe it. it of, 
I don't think, I think it has more to do with what we are culturally than what, and maybe Snow White represents that in the Disney sense, but we're, we were really, you used the Snow White, the Disney Snow White as some sort of structure, Too and then we, we began to break away from that, like she becomes, Snow White Red becomes Snow White, and then we have the primaries, and then the white, the white snow becomes the name, Walt becomes Walt Paul. It's like the break, we're pulling the whole thing, and in terms of a narrative, in terms of the narrative, what was happening, I think, what it is that, yes, there's a beginning, and it was really, we worked for a long time to find the animals, like she was gonna coexist with the but animals. But tons of animal costumes. And animals it was the whole scene and yeah, and that everything. we never got to. We, we couldn't get to it because we couldn't figure out the animals. Yeah. So we will go back and shoot the animal. That will happen after the piece leaves the armory. We'll go back to the animals, I think. I w we'll still do it. At this point, what's happening is that it starts with her, in a to a degree, starts with her wandering in the forest. Then she goes to the house, mm -hmm. and then it's kind of, it has a connection to the Snow White story. Mm -hmm. She goes to the house, mm -hmm. she cleans, goes to bed, they come home, they go into they the party. house, they kind of party for a bit, go into the house and find her. And then they go to bed and mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it does play, you know. It's, there, that, that's a Snow White, that's in that narrative. And the dinner, I, too. And the dinner, and then what, and there's a dinner. Yeah, there's a, they, but yeah what's and there's a cooking, there's all these other, like, satellites, you know, to the thing that's, that's not part of the traditional Snow White narrative that are very, a big part of ours. Like, the cooking show is something, we've been wanting to make a cooking show for years, we've so been talking about making a cooking show. Yeah, yeah, it was, I mean, it was, we've been wanting to do a cooking show that had weird kitchens, like four kitchens hooked together and this weird thing about it. And um, yeah. Snow White gave us like the opportunity to, to have, it, we wanted to do it, but how do you get like, ah, oh, we want to do this cooking show, but then really how do you take it from here and make this happen? Like what really happens in this cooking show? Who are the characters in the cooking show? How do you make this cooking show? Okay, let's put it on a burner and let's wait. And then white snow comes along and it's like, wow, what if Walt and white snow have a cooking show? So then the, the, the whole kitchen, the kitchen's designed as a cooking show kitchen. I mean, we built it. It's my kitchen, but it's bigger than a normal, it's bigger than my kitchen. And the lighting grid is built by guys who like built the Food Network lighting grids, you know, and how it's lit is like the Food Network lighting guys come and help us light the cooking show thing. But there's this other thing I think where it, after she, after the, she, she's found, like the part of the story of the narrative of Snow White, then there's a kind of dinner. And then if you, if you, you know, that you ask this question about things will go crazy or something like that. But I, what is the, one of the powerful elements, or not, not powerful, like one of the main elements of this whole thing was this series that I'd written of this series of parties and it goes from dinner party, dancing party, kids party, drinking party, corral, drinking party, rumpus room. And the rumpus room is when Walt's taken to the basement. The doors, it's when the men, the end of the party's happened, party's over, women- Everybody's drunk. Everybody's drunk, women are passed out, and the men go to the basement where the party starts again. And now it's getting serious, and it gets serious down there. That was this jest, and I, you know, I think back on it in a funny way, growing up in the suburbs, there, there was, a lot of the houses had what was called a rumpus room. And the rumpus rooms were these basement rooms where the adults partied late at night. And I remember Christmas Eve or something like that, all the adults would be in the rumpus room, which was this all it was was a room down in my basement next to my bedroom with a bar. And the only time the bar was ever used were a series of these parties. And it, in a way, if you, in, in some crazy way, I think what was in the back of my head is I was reenacting or setting up the situation in which this suburban, party would happen, and, the, and in a way, 
it, the suburban party that happens, the, the white snows are the women who've been, came to the party, there's Walt, Walt's like in the party, they're having a party and they get drunk. And then the drunken party just goes raves on. And I kept saying, it's a rave, we're just making a rave. And you could say that this first piece, this first, I look at it, the this, this first lay, this first chapter in White Snow, which is the chapter that we send here, is the chapter of the rave. And then you have all the satellites where Walt Snow, White Snow and Walt are the Etant Dene, or they're Adam and Eve, or there's the, there's the, the yellow, cooking yellow the cooking show, the yellow and the blue, uh, uh, Snow Whites in their bedroom. Like these are all satellites or spin-offs of this main thing, which is the party. And when Damon, you know, like I get, when the piece comes to a certain, you know, we, we, after we load the trucks and get the piece out of here, the question was, and it was the big question all along, is could we edit the piece? We ended up with 350 hours you were got it down to maybe 28. And we couldn't even look at all the footage. I then split. It's actually uh, 54. Hours? Yeah. Oh, okay. I split. The, the editing just goes on. And you know, like what we know now is, is that the part that we know is, is that this party scene is probably, the parties are The party hours. scene is um, just the one drinking scene is two and a half hours. Yeah. But can I ask about structure? Because in my, this is maybe just my upbringing, but I kind of thought that the, the structure was loosely based around the sort of um, Catholic version of the, of the universe. You know, you start with Adam and Eve, and you start in a kind of paradise, and then in, par in, in some paradise, you then move to love, which turns to lust, which turns to greed, and then to gluttony. And then, then it sort of, the structure then moves from paradise to purgatory and, and into hell. And like almost like Dante-esque in the way that it also descends. I mean, it's actually, the structure moves from yeah, a forest does. into a house, yeah. into, into the does. basement. It definitely goes from a... And as you said, the ro like almost the structure of the room. You know, they get drunk, they get more and more drunk. Yeah. And as they get more and more drunk, they descend further and further. And in physically the end, they do too. I mean, you yeah. do end up outside in the forest which maybe you could say would be the higher level, and you, and the, you know, the movie ends, you're in the rumpus room, which yeah. is at the bottom and of the And it a kind of punishment, no? I mean, this, this, uh, isn't this final act, the final act being, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Walt has been sodomized with a broom. Uh, this we, sort of, well, White this, Snow dies in front of the house of essentially alcohol poisoning. Yeah. She dies several times. I mean, how many times we actually get into this one? I don't know. I mean, two, two times she dies. I mean, I think she died. She dies. Well, she dies outside the house in the forest and outside the house of the set. Of the set. So she but dies. She dies several times. She in dies that several times. Same version. Like it's like as the as the dwarves decide to take Walt to the basement. In a sense, in a sense, Walt doesn't belong there. They carry That's him the down. crazy. The crazy part is he thinks he's part of the group, but he's actually an outsider. Yeah. And it's, it's a, they at one epic. point, as he gets drunker, he gets a little more aggressive. Drunken lead to a little more aggression, kind of picks a fight with Grumpy. Grumpy says, you know, they just at one point decide, well, what the fuck? We're, yeah, gonna, we're gonna take Walt to the basement and show him well, how to Well, before that, they beat him up. I mean, they take him outside and beat him up. And then he comes back inside and it's kind of like, ah, oh, he's here again. Okay, let's just. Let's take him and to it's the like basement. every time it's like, hey, you guys keep taking it easy. And take it's it kind of like you can imagine, like that's what happens in like sort of barroom fights. Like the drunk dude keeps coming back, and eventually they have to take care of him, and so they take him to the basement. And and when he gets to the basement, then they 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 play a game with him, which is all about bobbing for apples. But the end of the game is they sodomize him, and then what? And they're constantly drinking. They're constantly drinking. And I think you go, well, is that Walt? Well, it's Walt Paul. You know, like it's me there. And it's, it's, a, it's a male. It's again the 50 year old. You know, like a, who, male. which male is it? It's, a, it's an iconic male of some sort. And who are the dwarves? They're iconic men of some sort. Like it's a gang. And the gang teaches the outsider a lesson, you know? 
And you but what is this? What is this? It is an icon. But what is it an icon of? What is it a metaphor for? What is the symbolism here? That of, what, of, who? Of, 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 of the of the whole structure with the dwarves, with Snow White, with Walt, and the and the, and the structure. Well, there's the story, a structure where it descends. Yeah, it descends into a you know it descends, and the final you know it descends deeper and deeper to the point that she dies, and Walt basically left for dead of some sort, or left as a sculpture. Yeah. In one way, he's left as a sculpture. He, he's built as a sculpture. Yeah, yeah and he ends, up, he ends up on the floor as a sculpture with a broom up his ass, you know? Then you and have... done with him. I mean, then it, it, it kind of ends at that point until we pick up the chapter again. Chapter two happens after we take the piece back. But when at this point, the ending at this point, which is, I don't think we'll make it into, I think... Well, it may be here. Part no, is the, that the prince comes. The prince will be there. Yeah, the it's prince come. comes, and then the prince is really brought in. He's not brought in to have. He's brought in. He's not really brought in to kiss and awake White Snow. He has no interaction with anybody. Yeah, he's brought in to have sex with a sculpture. As an and object. Then, and then what he's having sex with is an object. It's love of the object, love of an object. Love of the sculpture. And the, the sculpture being the object, that we love our objects. And it, he's brought in for that. And he, so he's, he's a symbol in some way, or an icon of, of our, our lust for our possessions, or our fetish our obsession for our possessions. Of an object. And he's brought in after. He's an after. He's his own world, and he does this in in the forest. Now, the thing he has sex with is he has sex with a sculpture of white snow. It is, but it's a removed, per, it's not an actual person. It's not even meant to look like a person. It's, yeah. it's meant to look it's, like it's an object. It's a pale silicone sculpture. There's no paint, there's no hair, there's no nothing. It's and you, and you right out of the mold. And then he, at one point also, also at one point, he, stands in front of the house. White Snow several times, se several times stands in front of the house and poses as a sculpture. He performs the act of ejaculation as a sculpture in front of the house. So the sculpture, as a Greek sculpture in a yeah, way, really. like very, but, but a Ken doll in a way. Very like statuesque. He's statuesque, but he's, his whole sense of his body and everything is almost, un he's not real. In a way, we chose several princes to, to play this role. All of them have physiques and bodies that, that uh, are ideals. Specimens is yeah. what some of the girls at the studio would call them. <laughs> <laughs> One thing which is very specific is this idea that there is a construction of a piece in your studio in LA, which we saw you know, visiting you, then the idea of deconstructing the piece, then the idea of actually putting the piece on the trip, then the piece arriving here um, and being reconstructed. Yeah. Um, and it would be interesting, I think, if you could talk a little bit about that. I, I think one thing, you know, like one huge decision, like giant decision that happened, when we got through f taping, we realized that we had actually got the piece to a point where we didn't know whether we could take it apart. Yeah. without damaging it. And there was a huge discussion. There were two things. One, could we edit the tape? Two, could we take it apart? And yeah, the workload question became very difficult at that point because yeah, yeah, we knew yeah. that we would got to a point where we only had this much time to get it in a box here. And it was a question of whether or not you could take that piece apart without messing it up. And I think we had, once we'd covered that, not to... We were sure we could Which take it apart. Which was always the daunting thing before we were shooting, was like, how do we, you know, once we decided to take the forest, when you guys saw it the first time, it was, there was no foliage on it. And then we put all this, these plants on it, we cover this thing in plants, and then it was, that was a huge decision too. And then it was like, well, now that we've done this, how do we take that thing apart? There's something like 50,000 fake plants there. And how do you take those apart and make sure that they go back where they should and not destroy this thing. So that was, that was a troubling thing. And then we shoot the thing, and yeah. you end up with 350 hours of video footage, and then you're kind of like, well, 
how do you make this? You know, how do I take, the, I can't even watch 350 hours of video in the time that I have to edit the entire thing. I don't have 350 hours. Yeah. <laughs> and then this thing of like, we, so we're faced with this set of problems where we almost close the whole thing down. We can't do it, it's impossible. Yeah. Then the question was, could we move it? And then once, and we went through the whole process of what it meant to move it. Like how over we would take it apart. Again. We had people figuring out every little bolt, how we take it apart. Once we just say we can take it apart, but it's risky business, but we'll take it apart. Then can we edit it? And then it's risky business, no, we can't. So both sides. There was a moment where the taking apart was then the easy part. Yeah. Then like see. it was really like, okay, yeah, you, we can do this. We can take this apart and move this. That's okay. And but can we edit it? And I think one thing that's kind of interesting about taking it apart is that, and one thing that had happened over the past four or five years that creates the continuum, it creates a continuum in a, in, a, in a genre of work, is that I had moved a friend's studio who had died from his yard to Berkeley, and we picked up his whole, like these, this wood sheds, wood sheds that contained all of his paintings, put them on a truck, outside. and shipped them here. Then, at one point, we moved we bought a submarine, which is a hundred and fifty feet, feet long submarine. Submarine, and it was Hollywood in parts, set. a Hollywood set, thirty feet wide, and we moved it from north, from north Hollywood, all the way to our studio, and we moved it with East Los Angeles. Late at night, and we had a pl we had a route Down that went the Sunset Boulevard. It went past Universal Studios, past the Hollywood Boulevard, across Hol I mean a Hollywood Bowl, across Hollywood Boulevard, down Sunset all the way to our studio. It had a path that it could, it, it dissected or, or cut through Hollywood. And so we'd moved this and moved, and we filmed all this. We filmed moving the, the, the person's uh, studio, uh, studio or, or sheds. We filmed moving the submarine. Then there was the thing of moving a boat from Long Beach all the way up to Tehachapi into a desert. Into a desert, and there was this. All of a sudden, there a was this. There was this thing of moving objects across or through cities. We didn't really plan. And how this. to do it? I mean, it was always like when we move this thing, like okay, how do we? You know, we we'll buy this submarine. Sure, okay. It's almost like we almost got it for free because the guy didn't couldn't deal with it anymore. And it was like, okay, well, now what? You know, how do we get this? crazy object here and Through figuring Hollywood. out how to do that. So this, the, once this, the, the idea of moving this thing had a certain attraction because it in a way was part of a group of pieces, like a theme was A going, process of moving. Moving objects and moving things. So this thing was all of a sudden, whoa, we're going to move an object from Los Angeles to New York. We're going to go all the way across the, the country, and we're going to move white snow in a series of white trucks all the way across America, and like 80 or 90 of them. And that in itself became, wow, that's pretty fucking interesting. Then the next part is- Almost gonna, a performance of yeah, its own. I mean, it yeah, really we're going to move this. it back, and we set it up again. So the piece, in a sense, has this element that is about moving it, Shooting on it, it's a live thing. It, giving you, it to New York. You, you, yeah, giving it to New it York back. and taking it back. And we start again. And that, I think, is interesting. It, so it became it. interesting, the process of moving it, setting it up, reshooting. The idea we reshoot again. And the deconstruction of the pieces yeah. was a huge part, you know, and how you do that and how you break this thing down physically. It's actually the practice becomes the piece. Right. So it's not just yeah, that it's a practice. It. Like when we say we move the piece, we say we make a piece. A piece is being made, and the piece being made is moving it. So it's, it's a spin, but it's a piece. So the movement of the moving the piece, moving the piece is a piece. It's not... And what about the exhibition of the piece here? Is that the yes. piece too? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We got time-lapse cameras. We're going to set the, that all up. It's all part of this whole thing. I mean, we really do feel like that this thing is not ever done. So it is a piece that's constant. So whether it's sitting here and people are looking at it, it's still getting worked on.
And I, and Even I as viewers. Yeah, right. And I think there's an element of while well, pieces end, they peter out. But you said an interesting thing, Paul, like to me, I, and it just was kind of like rings with me that a lot of times you've said when we've been saying, well, how is it, how is it going to develop and blah, 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 what are the details? And you said you kind of act as a system like the, the, the work is what it is. It will be what it will be. Yeah. yeah. Like it's almost like the work sometimes actually surprises you. It and like it's so almost way. like an autonomous being. Yeah. But it, it's an autonomous being and you can take, but you can also say elements play a part. Like elements outside of our control play a part. And they, they begin to mold it. You know, like in one way you could say the piece happened because the armory happened. Like there was a molding process right there. And you know. Uh, yeah, we might not have made it yet. Yeah. Which is for us fantastic in that sense because it, it did, and I think the piece is great. I think it's one of the best things we've ever done. And I do think that, you know, having an opportunity to show it here has made us figure it out. And I look at it like it's, one of the, maybe it's the strongest piece we've done, and you could kind of say, what I see in it is its strength, and its strength or its potency or whatever it is as a real object is yet to come. I like it's, I don't see it, like I look out there and I think, yeah, it'll go in that building there, but it comes back, and it's like when we did the rebel, a piece that, which is, in one way you could say the rebel is the beginning of, of or it starts Snow White in a certain direction, but you kind of go, sometimes like a I piece just related needs. Related to it more than started it. I think that, yeah. you know, Snow White was already in it. Yeah. You know, I think that we actually, you know, when we did rebel, I think that you drew from the ideas that you were thinking about yeah, of do, Snow White yeah. to help you know, guide you through your character in, in Rebel. And that was the crazy part when we did Rebel. We, we kind of almost backed out of Rebel because it was too close to Snow yeah. White. Natalie Wood, Snow White, too close. Yeah, once the we house, made that connection, then it was like, oh man, this is like, and then we it was don't, like, do well, we give we it all to, away? Yeah, We're we, giving it all away. We want to give Snow White to Rebel. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, this whole idea of a, uh, a reconstruction of the piece here architecturally it would just be great to hear a little bit about how you, um, you know, will install the piece within this architecture of the armory because it will not only be the forest, it will also have this very important component, of course, of the moving images in a multi-screen environment. Um, and can you tell us a little bit maybe about how the spatial experience here will be? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it'll be. Um, it's well, different than it is in our studio because in our studio, the forest is in one room and the sets are in another. So immediately, there's a connection where there's a difference now. They're both in the same room. They're slightly disoriented from the way that they were originally. So that, the, the, the structure of that is gonna be very brand new for us. And then to see it in, in that space compared to our space will be quite, quite different as well. Um, the video, you know, in that room with those eight screens in there will be crazy. I mean, it's gonna be an environment that's probably like no other one. I, you know, that's the, this thing of like the, the four, you know, like we, in our studio, like Damon said, it was in two rooms, and it was connected by a doorway, like you could actually go out of walk the... one through walk, one into the other. So you could kind of, they were connected, but they had a wall. There's a wall and then a door and a kitchen... Physically connected, but spatially separated. The kitchen looked right into the forest. You could go from the forest into the kitchen. And now, and, we, and they were side by side. Then in this building, it's a, it's a rectangle. So then the question is, it can't go side by side uh, because it would be too wide. So we have to shift the sets, which are the interiors of the house, to either the back or the front of the forest. And when we were here at one point, Tom had recommended that we put the forest in front in order to create like a certain dynamic, that, an element where you didn't see everything when you walked in. I think that both Damon and I probably wouldn't have gone along with it. We probably would have put the, the forest first. front, the yeah. forest front and the set, the set behind it. The problem happened, 
as do things when you say, well, things will be what they are. One of the things that happened is there's no way we can get the peace up if we had done that. We, one of the main things is, is that we have to bring the interiors in first and then the garden. Amen. If we don't do that, there's no way we can get it up in three weeks or whatever we have, so four weeks. So it was impossible. But so the peace in some ways is an aesthetic decision to have the interiors and then the forest. And in some ways, it's a decision on just practicality to get the piece up. It's, yeah. it's made for us. What about the role of sound? Because it seems to me the work... Well, we did, you know, sound when, is so vital. The, when, we, when we get to the video, like the decision at one point began that we would, because we couldn't, we didn't have enough time to really screw with the sound. And we still don't know exactly what it means. I'm but, going back on Wednesday to just do sound for 10 days. So what we, because th we think sound is a huge problem in there, but we have four It's absolutely screens. important, you know, it's not just that it's a problem in that space, but it's absolutely important to get that sound to right. Something. I mean, this, to, to something that we're, that we, have we, to, yeah. that we like, I mean, that, that makes sense to us. And we won't, a lot of it is that's a big hall with a lot of bouncing around sound. So we have like the four screens which are duplicated and that makes eight screens. And we think that's how we try to control the sound. We're trolling, controlling the sound of four. There's one audio track yeah. for all eight screens. So we um, think that is the only way we can control it. But then we have multiple which speakers. Which different than what we've done before. Like with Pirates, um, there was, I don't know, when we showed it last at, in Ghent, there was 17 projections and 40 speakers and you know, 15 and they, different soundtracks. Um, here, what I've done to, to simplify it a little bit, and, and it, Pirates, you know, was a long time ago, and for us, that was a huge undertaking on how to do that. Like, we've, we'd done other things before, but that was really a massive thing to try and figure out, and how to do that, and how to show that, and how to deal with that much footage, because we'd never had that much before. So now, I've learned a ton on how to deal with that much stuff, and how to try to get where we are now with that much information. And it means that you narrow it down to a simple soundtrack, which isn't simple, it has 49 different channels, so it's not simple. I mean, there's, there's 50 layers inside that one audio track. So each screen has the same audio track, but there are 50 layers inside that track. And we can't, and one of the things about it is, is that we, because we weren't, we couldn't videotape until it was so late, and then we just plow, plowed through 28 days of taping, and then we have this much time to put everything together, is that we can only do what we can do in that amount of time. So we tried to get it to a place where we could manage it, and then in the, um, manage it, and then get it to a place in which we could uh, show it. Yeah, that we were and, happy with. I mean, that was my biggest problem with it, when you know, once we decided, okay, we could actually move this thing, now what does it mean to edit it? And, and the hardest decision for me was, is, to be comfortable enough with the edit that I would you know, be happy to show it something to somebody. And that was complicated, because in reality, I, I mean, I haven't even watched it. It's a seven hours long on four channels, straight seven hour movie. There's not a break in it, and it's start to finish. There's no repetition, there's no nothing. And those four channels are in sync. So you see four different views of one thing at once, you'll see, this happened and this happened that is like going on at the same time as this. So it's really quite crazy in there. But it was, you know, even still, I haven't watched the whole thing I've finished. I think now um, the guy that we work with that helps us shoot and he's watching it now. And I think he's, you know, sits down and watches a seven hour movie. And, you know, you kind of look at it and you think, just like we'll reshoot chapter two or we'll shoot another chapter two. The well, edit, edit yeah, and then the edit, I think I was thinking about the other day, I'm imagining that the edit that we do next is, is an edit in which you end up with more complex, you end up not with four channels, but you end up with 18, 19. And the 18, 19 then have to be placed into a room. And we can actually do that in our studio. We can actually, I think, in our studio, create 18 to 19 screens with a certain synchronous and a, and a way of 
of constructing an audio. Here, we're unable to do that because we can't, we don't have the, the time. Because it's extremely complicated to do that. So yeah. It so takes we time. just, it, it's like, it's like you, that's what I mean when I say, well, I can see where it's going to happen, what's going to happen. But that's why the piece is interesting. It just happens that we're moving towards a piece being finished or at least coming to some sort of petering out and coming to some point that we really are, want. In the meantime, the piece is moving and the piece gets set up again and that's part of the piece and part of the element and the spin-off is that it moves. So what would you say to people who, you know, would then come kind of criticize the armory and say, this is not appropriate for this kind of Well, venue. okay, I'll say two things, maybe three. But one is, is that the piece was being made back before. We were working on the piece. And then, yeah, we shut it down and we started back up. And part of re-bringing it back was that the armory was here. But we said, one of the things I said when it started, I said, look, the piece is going to be what the piece is. I don't know what it's going to actually turn out to be. Either the script can, you know, like what we actually do, we, we won't know. And I knew back then that the subject probably would, would cross lines, these lines of, of uh, which lines of what, I don't know, violence, sexuality, because it was going to talk about all that. It was, it was, absolutely it was built in the subject and it was going to talk about it. It was going to create or it was about, it's not that the pieces, I think the piece and I think of art is something where you can have this discussion, you can talk about these subjects, you can bring them up. Like I think it's important, especially today, to bring up these issues that I think White Snow does. It brings up issues. And it, what it's... Issues? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good, it's good. It's really good. Well, okay, yeah. <laughs>